to come to a consensus about where the most fruitful research to resolve this conflict should be engaged. The broad consensus, pushed strongly by James Clerk Maxwell, was that the luminous ether must exist. People took it as an obvious truth that space was absolute and unchanging. There was also no reason for anyone to think that time was anything but a universal thing that permeated all of creation. Remember at the latter part of the 19th century, the universe was only the stars in the sky and the Milky Way. It was also thought to be ageless, with time just being the thing that we measured out of the years of our lives and everyone everywhere felt the same flow. This meant Galilean relativity was about to be thrown out. Everyone was convinced that there must be some absolute reference frame from which we can measure absolute space and absolute time. On its face, this seems to be pretty logical. Maxwell derived the speed of light from known experiments and knew it propagated as a wave. Further, as a speed, it meant that something must be moving with respect to something else. To paraphrase Shakespeare's chorus in King Henry V, thus with our imagined wing, our swift photon flies in motion of no less celerity than that of thought. Much faster than thought, actually, and with respect to its home medium that had yet to be discovered, the luminiferous ether. This quest to discover and measure this ether, which everyone was convinced must exist, generated vigorous research in the 1880s and onward. Let's presume that the ether is completely undetectable except through its interaction with light. It has no impingement on mass in any way. Now, if the ether was still or stationary, then as the Earth went around the sun, all light rays in existence would experience an ether wind. That's what's indicated by my cartoon. The red hash is the ether that, by being stationary, would create a wind in the direction of Earth's orbit around the Sun. For example, if the light was radiated in the direction of Earth's motion, then the light would experience a headwind and be slower. Furthermore, if at any given point on the Earth's surface, the magnitude and direction of the wind would vary with the time of day and the season. In order to measure this wind, you would need some source of light that would send rays in two different directions, preferably orthogonal. If the distance they travel is long enough, then one of the two directions will encounter the ether wind and be slower than the other. You can orient these directions any way you want and keep taking measurements. It shouldn't take long to pick up the wind. It was understood that since the speed of light was roughly 10,000 times faster than the speed of Earth going around the sun, the measurement would need to be cutting-edge technology. Enter Albert Michelson, seen at the top. Michelson was fascinated by light for his entire career. After a long history of hundreds of years of numerous experiments to firmly establish the speed of light, Michelson contributed to the effort in 1879. He measured to be 299,909 kilometers per second. In 1881, he invented the Michelson interferometer. A sketch of that is shown here. A source of light is sent towards a half-silvered mirror, which breaks it into two rays of light going to two mirrors. These mirrors reflect the light, which was then seen by a detector. Because the light has a wavelength, this procedure will put the two rays out of phase, creating an interference pattern in the detector. If you carefully adjust the length of one of the distances to one of the mirrors until the rays meet coherently at the detector, you're ready. You then simply rotate the apparatus until the rays become out of phase again. When they're out of phase, this would mean that there is some ether wind slowing down one of the rays as it pushes back on it. My moving cartoon shows this effect on the Blu-ray. Michelson's first attempt in 1881 was not sensitive enough, and so in 1887, he and Edward Morley made the great improvements and created their famed Michelson-Morley experiment, which you see in the picture. It was also an interferometer, bouncing the light on a much longer baseline with many mirrors. To reduce vibrations and increase sensitivity, it was all set up in a huge block of sandstone suspended in a tub of mercury. In the spring and summer of 1887, the two men labored to find the ether wind. To their great dismay and surprise, they found nothing. All of the runs of their experiment never showed any phase shift. They were forced to conclude that they had had a null result. Specifically, they could not observe the expected wind and published it in the fall of 1887, and this is considered the most famous null result of all time. This didn't settle it, though, because people could not believe that this null result was true. Morley himself did not believe his own results and went on to do numerous experiments of ever-increasing sensitivity. All null results. 
This lack of ether wind was studied and confirmed by many other experiments up until the 1930s when multiple teams of researchers across the world came to the same conclusion with their own interferometers. The work was considered settled, but so troubling that starting in the 1950s, with the invention of lasers and masers, research happened again on interferometry with even greater accuracy. Dozens of teams across the world used the new technology to try to find the ether until the 1970s. They all failed to find the ether wind. And this put the issue to rest until the 21st century. Starting in 2003, a new resurgence in re-examining this settled science arose due to new theories of quantum gravity, which predict violations of special relativity on measurable scales. These new studies, with the most recent in 2015, showed no ether wind to the greatest accuracy yet with no evidence found of any variation of the speed of light in any direction to one part in 10 to the 18th. We are now forced to conclude, even though it's an astonishing and lightly unbelievable result, that the ether does not exist. There is no medium in which light travels. Returning to Shakespeare, all these grand failed efforts to find the medium of light's waves remind us of the last part of Hamlet's famous soliloquy, all these researchers tried to probe the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, which puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others we know not of. The ill that we have is that there is no medium for light's traversal. Over a hundred years of searches by dozens of teams have all failed to find it. But now let's go back to see what happened in the wake of Michelson and Morley's 1887 null result. 